Okay, we'll listen to this painful experience of Lance got onto the majority report. Good job, Lance, your big break. Polling has kind of uh, tightened in, in, in recent days when it comes to liberals v. conservatives. So give yeah. us the, the lay of the land. Trudeau called for this election thinking it seemed to be like a, a slam dunk for him. It's not looking that way thus far. Wait, can somebody t explain to me what this means? I don't know. I don't understand Canadian politics. When they say he called for an election, does that mean they're just they would have no elections until like two years? Can he call for an election early? Why would he do that? What is the point? He can call early because he wanted to get a majority. He's polling well, so it's to strengthen his position. He has to go for a general election. Isn't that kind of weird? Is, or isn't that a little bit bullshit? Or is that a, do we consider this a good thing of the political system or a shit thing of the political system? Yes, Destiny, literally no one likes it. No, it's fine. Pretty shit. It's bullshit, but it's a bonger thing. It gives him a lot of power. It depends. It's part. I've heard this happening in bonger politics, too. Did Cameron do this? Or what? Did Merkel do this in Germany? Fuck, what European political scene? Somebody tried to call... Maybe... Somebody tried to call, I think, an election, and it went so fucking horribly. Oh, was it Theresa May? That she tried it and it just went so fucking horribly. I think she ended up like resigning or something afterwards. I don't. I don't remember it, it, that that whole concept of like calling an election. Like let's do one now. Like it just feels so fucking stupid. I, I don't. I don't know. It seems really really weird to me. I don't. I don't understand it at all. But wow. I mean, for someone who said that you don't know much about the election, that was pretty much all I had to say. That's a good summary. Oh, okay. Um, See you later. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm doing my one shot on the majority yeah. report to be the resident expert of anything. Um, so, oh my god, he's overselling himself so hard. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a really funny joke that was that was way more than I thought it should have been. But okay, good. Uh, for any of your viewers who don't know, Canada is not a made-up cartoon. It's a real country. Uh, it's just <laughs> to the north of you. And uh, we actually do a lot of cartoonish things. Like we have a parliamentary system here, uh, similar to every other uh, old colony. Uh, and we still have the queen as our head of state, uh, which is also kind of silly. But part of this parliamentary system and the way it works is that you basically don't get to vote for your prime minister. I don't get to write down that I want to vote for, say, uh, Jagmeet Singh, who's who I would probably vote for had I given uh, been given the choice. What you do is you vote for your local MPs in your area, and then all the MPs kind of team up together, kind of like a Captain Planet style. What is MP? I'm guessing it means Member of Parliament. I don't know why he wouldn't say that, but okay. Uh, or uh, Power Rangers or whatever metaphor you want. And then if you get enough seats, AKA enough MPs, you get to form the government. The magic number is 170. So if you get 170 MPs in your party, then they form the majority government and they can basically rule with an iron fist, which is what Trudeau got to do for a little while uh, until he lost his majority government and has had a minority government. When you have a minority government- Destiny is being so petty, everyone calls them MPs. He's giving an explanation for people that are, are, are into Canada, like, should I ban this guy? If he's giving an explanation for non-Canadians, you just you should say like what MP means. Destiny, everyone says MP. Nobody in the US says MP. Nobody's any idea what the fucking MP is. I didn't know what an MP was. I only know MP because I know members of parliament or uh, M, um, your, what are they called? Your, uh, member of European parliament? It might be MEPs, I think. For That's the only reason I was able to guess it is because of the EU. Fuck off. You're a dumb fuck. You have to either uh, do deals with like-minded parties, and it actually works out a lot better because you don't have this kind of like either one party uh, enacting authoritarian, not authoritarian, but as, as close as you'll get in Canada, um, you know, uh, unilateral rule. Polling has kind of... Oh. Uh, enacting authoritarian, not authoritarian, but as, as close as you'll get in Canada, um, you know, uh, unilateral rule they have to work together with other parties, which kind of helps out. It's kind of the advantage, in my opinion, of a parliamentary system over kind of what you have in America, which is the two-party pendulum swing effect kind of stuff. Gotcha. Hey, just as a reminder, and I will say this until the day I die, or somebody emails me correcting me that I'm wrong, but every single time I bring this up, every European that I ever ever talk to me about politics that I'm right, people complain all the time about America, two-party, America, two-party, America, two-party. And then the United States and America, people are like, look at how horrible it is that Joe Manchin has all the power. Joe Manchin has all the power. I have heard so many random stories. I should write these down more or just so I don't remember the parties. I've heard so many fucking horror stories of European countries where these small minority dipshit parties that nobody cares about ends up having so much influence in government because they have to form a coalition with another minority in order to form a majority government. Like, not to say that it's good or bad. I'm not saying anything is good or bad. 
But I'm just saying that, like, people in Europe or Canada will jerk off like they're, oh, we have more than two parties. We're so much better. It's like, yeah, okay, you say that until you have to form a coalition with the fucking, like, the weeb fucking party, and now you have to legalize anime fucking to keep that party happy when you try to run the actual country, okay? Shut the fuck up, all right? Gotcha. So, uh, what, I guess, are the... What were the reasonings for Trudeau uh, calling this election? It seems like probably it was based on the COVID response. Vaccination rates were high uh, very quickly in Canada. You guys outpaced us, even though you were behind for quite a while. Um, I can explain that. <laughs> so, so, so explain that to me. What, why did Trudeau call this election? Power. Yeah. That's... Yeah. But what, okay. uh, I'm so sorry, I know it, but uh, more, what were the headwinds? Yeah. Hey, I, I just, I actually hate him so much. I legitimately hate Lance. No, I don't hate him. I think he's one of the dumbest fucking people that I've ever seen talk about politics in my entire life. He's just so stupid. God, he's so fucking stupid. Yeah, uh, like, was it the COVID response? So, okay, so basically. At the time, the polling and most of the, I would say, intelligentsia was showing that Trudeau is pretty poised to win a majority government within this small time frame. So one of the things about a snap election in Canada is unlike the US, which is kind of just in a perpetual election cycle, this whole thing, as you can tell, wraps up very quickly. Like it, it was announced and in a month it's going to be over. So Trudeau's idea was that right now uh, we're doing very, very well for a lot of reasons. And unfortunately, not all the reasons are uh, because of Trudeau. Uh, once COVID started, basically Canada's answer to COVID was similar to a lot of other countries where it's like, we, we need to lock down. You need to stay in your homes. Don't touch each other. Uh, no more, uh, you know, glory holes or whatever it is that you were doing. And and what we should all do Whoa. is just, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, stay indoors. And, uh, you know, if you can work at home, if you can't, we need some uh, safety net, some sort of a safety net, right? Similar to the one time $2,000 checks that uh, y'all got and then the $1,400 checks after. So this is where having a parliamentary system works because Jagmeet Singh and the NDP, uh, they're basically... Uh, the lefty party in Canada. They're the workers party. They're typically very for unions, uh, worker cooperatives, uh, uh, you know, increasing pharmacare rights, dental care rights, stuff like that, stuff that all lefties kind of get on board with. They were the ones who pressured Trudeau and said to Justin Trudeau, hey, by the way, you need to enact this program. Uh, Canadians are going to need some form of a UBI to get us through this. That became what was known as CERB. So under that program for about seven to eight months, any Canadian who wanted would just log into a website. You wouldn't have to go through any vetting process. You just click I agree and you would get $2,000 in your bank account every month while COVID was going. Wait, I thought for CERB, I thought you had to be a worker to get that. D don't don't you didn't you have to be working? Am I wrong on that? Can somebody tell me? Like if you were somebody that was thirty and you were unemployed, Destin, you had to make a minimum of five thousand dollars in the last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you you ha you either had to be working or something, because because like it, let's say that you were thirty and you were unemployed for like a year, um, you you I don't think you got I don't think you qualified for this UBI. The, Can the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, I know this because I looked this up for the Katarana stuff, because she said that she had gotten that $2,000 stimulus, but when I looked up the um, Canada rules for it, um, you couldn't be unemployed like perpetually and then qualify for that. Um, or you can get it if you're a student, I believe, is possible as well. Or it might be if you're a disabled student. I'd have to go and check, but... Um, yeah, it was either all students or disabled students. If you were eligible, you could have received two thousand dollars for a four-week period. Uh, I'll serve tax. The benefit was available to workers who resided in Canada who were at least fifteen, who stopped working because of reasons related to COVID, or were eligible for employment insurance regularly, or who did not quit their job voluntarily, or who had employment and self-employment income of at least five thousand dollars in twenty nineteen. When submitting a first claim, you could not have earned more than a thousand dollars in employment and/or self-employment income for fourteen or more consecutive days within the four-week benefit period of your claim. Is he saying they just didn't check this or, I mean, you literally, you do an application. There's a status of your CERB payment. You should kind of, huh, okay, whatever. Maybe they didn't check until later or something, yeah. 
and down. Wow. And obviously it's, yeah, it was incredible. Saved a lot of lives. I had a lot of friends who were on it. Um, and uh, it was necessary because how else are you supposed to spend hours at home, not working and also buy food and pay rent, right? It d- doesn't work out. So that was an enormously popular program, which did very well for the liberals, even though it was in large part due to the NDP forcing mm-hmm. them to do that because they didn't want to. Um, so that's one thing that he went into this election thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, that's very popular. The second one being what Emma already mentioned, of course, is the vaccines. Now, Canada's beating America in the vaccine race isn't because of good old fashioned smiles, maple syrup or whatever the press has been telling you. Uh, it's entirely because of riches and greed. Um, what Trudeau essentially did is realize we're a very wealthy nation. We no longer have a vaccine production capability in this country because conservatives got it years ago. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy it from wealthier nations, sorry, poor nations and wealthy nations. So we bought a whole bunch from you, America, but then we also bought a whole bunch from this uh, global reserve, which is intended to be used for the poorest countries in the world, developing mm-hmm. countries to be able to get emergency vaccines in a case like this. We bought from that emergency pool as well with the idea that we're not actually as evil as this sounds we're going to replace them once we're all vaccinated kind of thing down the road but combined with all the sources and the the fact that canada is a wealthy nation it's very oil wealthy right uh we just bought all the vaccines we needed and got it i feel like kind of like that tim pool video i feel like when it comes to lance i could also like tell you every single thing he is going to say uh like give me if it's about like liberals or like conservatives especially like i can basically tell you every single possible thing lance is going to say and it's going to be the liberals are bad greedy evil capitalist horrible exploitation like it's always going to be that and if they ever do anything good ever it's only because leftists forced it upon them right like i feel like i can like i feel like this take is going to always be the take he'll give on any issue you know ne- you don't actually ever have to watch him and, and i can just tell you that will be his take for everything and, and more than likely i'll always be correct like everyone vaccinated so, uh, like, how was that even possible? How was Canada even to manu- able to maneuver that and, and just say, oh, yeah, we'll put more in this repository later? Seems like that should be disallowed given, I don't know, GDP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen globally that I don't think should be permitted that seem to be fine, depending on how much uh, wealth and capital you can exude. Um, I, I can't answer that question genuinely from a, a legal standpoint. I'm not sure. I am, I'm assuming everything was above board. It wasn't done in secret. It was it was very public, and it was also one of those things. Where- Wait, if everything was done above board and legal, then what exactly is he complaining about? Or what exactly was the problem? Or, or, or what was the immoral aspect of this? I don't, I don't even know what he actually is upset about, but... Uh, Trudeau was kind of like, I don't want the elder... Uh, Trudeau was kind of like, I don't want the elder to feel guilty about any of these decisions. Sorry. Got a puppy running through my legs while I'm on live air. Um, I don't want y'all to feel guilty about these decisions. I want y'all to just understand that we intend fully on helping out other nations and replacing these uh, in due time once we have the the ability to do so. But again, it's kind of like it's all these things that were making Trudeau popular. Um, he saw this as an opportunity to like it's it's a snap election called solely for the purpose of him getting a majority back because right. he well, isn't that isn't that literally going to be the definition it sounds to me like that's why anybody would ever call a snap election in any place ever right isn't it don't people usually do because they think that they're like powerful right now and they can win he doesn't like to work with other parties he doesn't like to work with the ndp the ndp right now has been fighting him for months for things that seem uh on the surface level to be commonplace like uh can we have more uh paid sick leave days can we have more mat leave days can we have more pat leave days uh can we please like the ndp proposed this proposal and i'm sure everyone on the show will agree with this kind of idea what if during this pandemic we have a situation where the richest canadians have made an obscene amount of wealth just like the richest americans just like the richest Europeans, just like every other billionaire onward, has made an obscene amount of wealth. Can we tax them from now on at 1%, at 1% for all their uh, accrued wealth? And uh, this is to the tune of anyone who makes more than $20 million or has more than $20 million in assets, we just tax them 1% to pay for the rest of the country, for the poorest Canadians, for the homeless Canadians, for those who are jobless, just for all the stuff we need right now under COVID does not seem controversial, right? And it was overwhelmingly approved of by Canadians. Canadians were like, yeah, this makes- Why do I feel like this is, by the way, this is a bullshit feeling. So get ready to fire up your Reddit engines because I might be totally wrong. But why do I get a feel like if I were to go and look up the NDP's like actual policy proposals or their actual platform, it's probably like some unimaginably fucking radical shit that most Canadians don't actually believe in. 
Is it is it all like reasonable? Like, oh yeah, these are goals that we can blah 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 blah. Or is it like some outrageously? Is it realistic the same way that Bernie Sanders like Medicare for all was realistic? Where they're like, where they where they take these unbelievably like far left positions and then they'll pull in like the nicest way possible to try to get to, and say like, oh look, like forty nine point nine nine percent agree with this particular thing. I'm so curious. Sense. If you have more than $20 million in assets, you should have to pay your fair share. And the liberals shut it down. Uh, I mean, the conservatives shut it down as well, but that goes without saying. But it's just, it's just one of those things that Trudeau didn't want to keep have to deal, uh, didn't want to keep putting up with these proposals where it makes Jagmeet Singh look very good. The NDP looks very good. They're like, yeah, let's tax the wealthy to pay for everybody kind of programs. He wants to have a majority again, basically. So essentially, he wants to toe this line by taking credit for the policy sets that put, that he was pressured into putting in place by the NDP while also calling the snap election in order to neutralize them and take back a more moderate liberal majority. Yeah, I, I would say that's like that's a very fair uh, condensed assessment of it. But I mean, if someone was here who was a Trudeau supporter, they'd probably be like, that's hogwash. OK, there's so many more factors at play. But I mean, if you're just looking at a at a very Coles notes version, that's what I would say is accurate. Well, there's a reason that I didn't have a Trudeau supporter on the show, though, to talk about. <laughs> so, um, I appreciate your assessment. Let's talk a little bit more about Trudeau um, and his relationship with the indigenous population in Canada, because I think that's gotten a lot of attention due to. Uh, this is why Lance was brought on is to talk. I Dude. How could you watch that debate? I know they haven't probably watched it. Imagine watching that debate and be like, yeah, this is definitely the guy I want to bring on to represent these issues. Oh, my God. To his green lighting of pipelines. And now here in the United States, we're talking about line three. Uh, not enough. On, I, I want to talk about it more, honestly, because um, it's yet another instance of this prioritization of... Uh, gas that's homegrown in north america so we can reduce our dependence on saudi oil by just supplementing it with our own and tribal lands be damned oh why do i know about this i think i researched this a little bit for my debate on that stage but i never got to talk about anything i looked up there's some type of is it like tar oil or something that exists i think in like northwestern canada that is like if they were to actually dig into it, they would have so much energy. Is it tar sands, oil sands? But I think they're having trouble politically, like getting the will together to go through it. But if they were to do it, I think there's like, there's like an unimaginable amount of energy there, isn't it? It's like a huge amount, I think. And, and rights of native people be damned. That's been quite a controversy from the left in Canada. Trudeau hasn't reckoned with this in really any meaningful way, um, is my understanding. If you could talk a little bit more about that fight uh, from from your perspective. Yeah, sure. I mean, Trudeau has been an absolute uh, wizard, I would say, at his ability to make it appear on the surface as if he's actually on board with a lot of popular causes. If anything, he's really good at taking populist movements and Ian Chad is saying apparently it's like very big environmental risks to access this stuff. Yeah. And then absorbing them into this kind of uh, corporate liberal machine to make it uh, more sanitized. So he'll, he'll do press ops. Uh, recently, there's been a bunch of discoveries of unmarked mass graves of children who died in residential schools in Canada. And he'll show up to them and he'll kneel and he'll, he'll you know, lean on one knee and he'll, he'll place flowers or uh, wear an orange shirt and the tear will go down the face. And he's been doing this uh, for as long as I've known Trudeau. He's very, he's very good at the, the optics of politics, whereas the actual policies themselves uh, are usually pretty abysmal. While he's doing that, while he's kneeling on the one knee and while he's, you know, the single tear is going down the face for the press op, he has been actively suing residential school survivors in court in order to prevent wow. them from getting what I would consider to be uh, just dues for their treatment as survivors under this program to the tune of 100 
million dollars. It's not a Dr. Evil figure. It's like, you know, there's no joke there. Like it's, it's horrifying, but that's what he'll do behind the scenes while, you know, publicly saying this is atrocious. How could we have committed cultural genocide? I'm so ashamed of my country kind of stuff. Um, he's got a really long history of doing those kind of things. Now, I don't want to completely 100% say that Trudeau has been abysmal for indigenous rights. He has in fact been better than say some of his predecessors. And he has put a lot of stuff uh, to the forefront. Like, for example, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission started before Trudeau came into power, but the findings of the commission came out while Trudeau was in power. And if you don't know what the Truth and Re uh, Reconciliation Commission is, it's the largest study, uh, academic study ever done. Um, uh, it was funded by the government. It cost millions of uh, dollars to do. It interviewed thousands upon thousands of residential school survivors, as well as other academics and academia, uh, ex-police officers, ex-nuns and priests to find out what was the situation uh, in the history of Canada and how did this affect the people and the findings uh, were what conclusively determined that this was, in fact, genocide. It came from from their own words. And then here's a whole bunch of calls to action in order to change the course of history that we're going down. Um, very few of those calls of action, calls to action have been implemented. Um, and a handful of them could have been done under Trudeau. I think some of the worst ones was one of Trudeau's, Trudeau's big campaign promises was to clean up all uh, drinking water on reserves in Canada. So for those who aren't familiar, Canada has a reserve system for Indigenous peoples uh, in which they'll usually take a whole bunch of different cultures and languages and uh, entire societies and they put them all, well, historically they would squeeze them all together in these small plots of land that were typically very far away from uh, mainstream Canadian society. So they had a lot of difficulty finding jobs obviously, because they were remote. They had a lot of difficulty with obviously drug abuse and alcoholism uh, because the living conditions were deplorable. That added to the fact that the Canadian government was literally taking their children out of their arms and forcing them into schools where they were tortured, beaten and sexually abused and stuff like that. So the whole thing is a mess. And it's almost entirely because of the, the actions of the federal government towards these people at the time. Taking that all in, Trudeau has a very good opportunity to make a lot of these situations right by improving the living conditions currently in, in today's day and age in reserves. There's still 54 reserves in Canada that don't have potable water, as in the drinking water in those. Where are those reserves at? I wonder if these are like reserves that have like barely any population that are like ultra fucking far north. I kind of wonder, but in those areas cannot be drank without boiling or finding it from a third party source, which you would think is something you would hear in, uh, in a country that wasn't nearly as rich as Canada. And yes, it's, it, uh, it's an incredibly complicated topic to say, how do you exactly fix that? But it's still something that was made as a campaign promise way back before he was even elected in his first run. So, I mean, it's it, if, in summary, if you were asking me, what is Trudeau's relationship with, with indigenous people? I would say it's very largely performative more than anything. It seems that way. It seems that way. And we, you're right to, to heap all that criticism onto him and, and uh, also say, well, he's been better than his predecessors. He's also been better than uh, in the United States, any president. We don't have any equivalent Truth and Reconciliation com Commission for the residential schools we had here in this country. Um, so the fact that he's fighting these survivors or the families of the survivors in court is unconscionable but you know again uh i wonder if lance would ever bring up like a specific case they're fighting but okay not necessarily something that we in the united states have uh, like to stand <laughs> well on. if i if i could just put one little pin in that thought though trudeau didn't start the truth and reconciliation commission that was actually started before trudeau uh, took power. He just oh. basically didn't fight the results of of the findings, right? Where, whereas I would say Stephen Harper was actively working to suppress other things that were going on within Indigenous discovery at the time. Well, gotcha. Okay, so bare yeah. minimum, bare minimum. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Uh, so the Conservatives are gaining momentum, at least in polling. That's what seems to be indicating. Uh, what are they proposing? What is their line of attack on against Trudeau uh, in the snap, okay. snap election? So I both want to make people a little less afraid because right now I'm getting a ton of emails from people saying, because our equivalent of Nate Silver over here in Canada is called 338. So if anyone wants to see the up and coming polls and projections, go to 338canada.com. But if you go there, you'll see at the very top, the federal vote for, uh, proje uh, projection, which means how people are going to vote federally, uh, is showing the I conservatives and the liberals at a deadlock heat with the uh, conservatives starting to surpass the liberals, which is a nightmare scenario for everybody, right? No one wants uh, the conservatives in power. I would rather the, the liberals stay in power as a minority with the NDP to push up against them and make them more lefty. 
What you should be more worried about and concentrate on is the federal seat projection, because that's all that matters. So it's it's very misleading for people right now to be like, well, the conservatives are taking the lead. Um, if you look at the federal seat projection, which is all that matters, again, how many seats are people going to have? Uh, they still have the liberals in the decided lead. So the liberals are still projected to get 141, which is a minority, the conservatives with 133, uh, and then the NDP with 36.3. Obviously, the, the people who have done the best in this election so far have been the NDP. They've gone up a lot since their last election. But sorry, to answer your question, um, what are conservatives proposing? The conservatives are led by a man named Aaron O'Toole. And pause for jokes. Apt, All right. apt, uh, apt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, who he's an odd fellow. He um, he tried to do this thing where he was going to rebrand the conservatives as being a little bit more progressive and as being a little bit more modern. And that backfired horrifically because clearly they didn't want that. So he tried to make it part of the conservative party platform just to admit that climate change is real. Not that they are committing to doing anything about it. Not that they are willing to say that like, you know, it's a uh, man-made or anything, but just to admit that climate change is real and active and we should acknowledge that that was one of his party proposals that did not go through like in, in uh, the last conservative board. It's very strange. So he has tried to do this mix of modernizing them. And if you didn't know Canada, because we have so many potential parties, we have a new one that started in the last election called the PPC. The PPC is Canada's uh, answer to, uh, I, I don't know, far right anti-immigration sentiment-esque, uh, if you could picture that in a party. They're like a splinter from the conservative party, but they're gaining a little bit of momentum. They have like 3.5% projected seats. Uh, so they're siphoning off some of the worst parts of the conservatives, I guess, from the, the conservative party. Um, outside of that, the big plans that uh, Aaron O'Toole's laying out are very, they're frighteningly populist. I will say that he recently put something out there that I just immediately on the surface love the idea of, and that is that every major corporation in Canada, once they reach a certain size, needs to have a worker's um, voice at the CEO board, which is odd to hear from a conservative yeah. party. That's and I'm sure you're all surprised. And then a whole bunch of academics in Canada looked into it and found out that the whole thing was purely ceremonial. Like what he's proposing would mean that like once or twice a year, um, you know, the workers would be able to sit at the CEO board and that would be nice and fun. But the whole thing is like show off your kids a kindergarten kind of things. Like it doesn't mean there's, there's, there's any agreement towards they have to listen to them. There's no bargaining power. This could be done in lieu of say like uh, unionization in lieu of actually having worker bargaining power in the workplace. Instead, you just get to sit at the table once a year and be like, all right, so what do you think? How are you liking your job? And you can be like, oh, well, we don't enjoy pissing and shitting in bags. That's uh, kind of uh, been terrible. So can we stop doing that? You're like, oh, nice, neat. All right, uh, round of applause, everybody. Look, they did it. They, 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 they did it. Great. All right, we'll see you in a year. Yeah, thanks. Good, nice to see you. You know, kind of stuff like that. Stuff that like really scares me because you get that sentiment from people like Tucker Carlson who are mm -hmm. pushing for populist ideas. And the more I see that coming from the right, the, the more frightening it can become. So he's been a mix of that, a mix of uh, we're going to build way more homes for Canadians, even though at the current measure, I think Canada has six empty homes uh, for every person housed. So, I mean, the supply and demand is not as much of an issue as the class and economics is. That uh, number is cannot be right. Six empty homes for every person housed? He must, he misspoke. Not even he could believe in something. So asinine. Absolutely no way. Unless you guys have like a fuck ton of houses in like northern like New Finland or some shit that are just like out there rotting. No fucking way. Um, but yeah, typical conservative stuff. Right. And, and so for the NDP, where do they stand going into this election on the 20th? So... The NDP, and I'm going to have to uh, admit to my bias here because I'm working on the sidelines trying to get indigenous. Oh, he might mean six open houses for every homeless person, maybe. This NDP members elected. So I'm going to give a shout out to Breen Ouellette, who's uh, one of the first indigenous uh I think the first, if he gets elected, he'll be the first Indigenous MP from Central Vancouver. So I'm helping with this campaign on Saturday. The first Indigenous MP from Central Vancouver. <laughs> what, 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 like, I am the biggest streamer from like the 68107 area code in Omaha, Nebraska in this presidential election. Like, like what, what, sorry, whatever, I don't know. Um, the NDP have been 
very forthcoming about wanting radical and drastic change, especially at a time like now. Um, Jagmeet Singh is the first MP to formally announce that their official policy is to end all oil subsidies kind of like day one kind of thing. So there's not going to be any more subsidies. Wow, that's super realistic. I'm sure that's going to go over well, Chief. Like ending all oil subsidies. Who do you think that's going to fuck the most? A subsidization, sorry, for the oil industry in Canada, which would be massive, which would be massive. I mean, as soon as COVID started, um, I believe we gave uh, the tar sands oil industry close to $10 billion in bailouts. I could be a little bit off on that number, but still for a company that's already making record profits uh, entering COVID, you don't think that that's something that me as a taxpayer would want to put my money towards, but there it is. So that's one of the big things. Today, they promised uh, universal pharmacare. And I know that might be odd to uh, Americans to hear, but uh, Canada does have a public health care system. We have um, we have uh, the same one as you, Medicaid or Medicaid. Is it Medicare or Medicaid? Which one uh, starts at 65? It's Medicare. Medicaid, right? Medicare. Medicaid Medicare? is, is uh, for, for seniors. No, oh, okay, Medicare sorry. is for, for seniors, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have the same system, except at, instead of at 65, it starts at zero, which is basically the biggest difference, right? Uh, but it goes yeah. by the same name. But most people don't realize in Canada that it doesn't really cover the neck up, and by which I mean anything that happens to your mouth, there's no dental care, anything that happens to your eyes, there's no eye care. And when it comes to mental health care, there's a very long waiting list typically. And then what will usually happen is if you have something extreme, like I've had friends uh, who were schizophrenic, they will be seen immediately by, by a healthcare worker, but they'll try to just give them which drugs work and try to do that drug combination rather than let's sit you down with a counselor, a psychiatrist, stuff like that. So uh, Jagmeet has come out and said that he's now going to push for full uh, uh, pharmacare programs. He's in the past tried to push for dental care programs, but they've been shut down by the liberals uh, for a variety of reasons. So he's going very strong into those um, very pro environment, very pro worker. Um, yeah, it's it's basically most of the things you'd probably be looking for in terms of uh, aligning yourself with leftist politics. Now, the criticism that you're probably going to get is that we have provinces in Canada the same way you have states in the U.S. and the provincial NDP. Lance is kind of giving a good argument against the Canadian health care system. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny that he just like repeated like every conservative attack on Canadian health care. That like the doctors don't treat you well because they get paid fucking shit money. There's a really long waiting list unless you have like a horrible fucking problem. Even if they see you, they just try to get you in and out as quickly as possible. Like there's still a lot of things that are uncovered. You still have to pay for your pharmacy, like your drug. Like I don't know. That's sorry, but is very different than the federal NDP and the provincial NDP in where I live, British Columbia, has been abhorrent. Uh, especially because there is now the deforestation going on in northern BC, as well as old growth forests, and they're being protected once again by indigenous people. Usually seems that when it comes to the clash with the environment, it's indigenous people who are at the front lines trying to protect it. And uh, the NDP is just basically not respecting any of their sovereign rights or uh, you know land back titles or stuff like that. So the BC NDP, uh, I cannot vouch for them. They're pretty bad. Uh, the Alberta NDP cannot vouch for them. They're pretty bad. As of what I've seen so far, federally, uh, Jack Meet Singh is the best option personally for me that I've seen. Um, the next parties would be the Bloc Québécois. Uh, there's not much to say about them except they're separatists. So it doesn't really apply unless you are someone interested in separating and becoming your own autonomous country in Quebec. Uh, and then there's the Green Party, which it's weird because I, you, you all have green in the U.S. and the Green Party in the U.S. sometimes is good. The Green Party in Canada is very strange. Um, yeah, it's the Green mixed... Party in the U.S. is not that mixed like, bag. Let's yeah, say. let's uh, well. Okay, okay. Can you tell me a bit about the U.S. Green Party and then maybe I can see how it differs? Well, it's 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 not really a it's not really a thing, and it's a lot of cranks who well, I mean, the um, main are disaffected. The main problem is like I have no problem against a third party, but the main issue seems to be um, it's focused uh, as a media operation during presidential um, uh, campaign season to run basically like presidential candidates and disregard any sort of more local power attainment and basically start at the top which right. I think we've seen look it'd be nice if it would have worked but I think we've seen the uh, outcome of that experiment at this point Okay. Well, uh, very similar. <laughs> okay. say. Well, I mean, their answer to a lot of the climate stuff uh, has been uh, very pro-capitalism, as in we can solve these issues if we just uh, funnel more corporate power into green energy power, kind of options like that. Um, and I'm not saying that there isn't like, it's like the climate disaster is such a, a multifaceted issue that you need to approach it from a variety of different means. But I'm just saying the Green Party is often 
bizarre in their approach to it. And as of right now, they're self imploding. Uh, they've got a very big problem where uh, there's a mix of uh, racism, anti Semitism, uh, attacking their own elected leader and trying to get their own elected leader ousted. This is happening right before an election was called. So at the moment, the, the Greens are kind of in self implosion mode. So for, I, I would say, for tenable. Uh, political parties. It's it's basically the big three right now. And like I said, there is that weird, super racist one that is uh, funneling votes away from the conservatives at the same time. Gotcha. Well, what what do people need to know ahead of uh, this election in terms of, you know, strategy, what you'd recommend uh, just to wrap this up? Sure. Um, as of right now, uh, the election is still pretty far away. I know uh, Canada operates kind of like in uh, dog years to human years in relation to the U.S. So even though it seems like it's very close and we got, uh, you know, a mere like uh, 23 or 24 days away from it or something like that, um, it's still a very long time in terms of election time in Canada. A lot is going to happen. What you're going to see is like giddy up. There's going to be a lot of scandals. Uh, they're all being kept uh, close to the chest right now. Uh, it was like, I think it was two or three weeks before the last election where we learned about Trudeau's love for blackface. So he may have uh, other uh, proclivities that we're unaware of that will, you know, see the light of day as, as the weeks come closer. Um, but you're probably going to see that typical roller coaster that you're seeing right now, which is the liberals will begin to sink and wonder what did they ever do to deserve this? And at the same time, the conservatives will rise uh, and then it'll become very scary because it's like, are we just going to lose the liberal minority and trade it for conservative uh, minority instead? Um, I, I would say if you want to be uh, active in this, if you're Canadian uh, or even if you aren't, because this is something that definitely affects you. Canada is one of the world's largest um, oil producers. Um, we produce an obscene amount of bitumen, especially from the, the tar sands. And it's one of the most destructive and wasteful ways uh, to produce energy. Uh, so it, it's something that you want to get involved with. Then please check out your local MPs. It's like anything else. It probably will make a lot bigger difference if you try to approach this election locally than if you try to approach it from uh, the sum totality. Like I just, I have to get Jagmeet Singh or Justin Trudeau elected. That's it. And if I don't do that, nothing's going to happen. Like at a local level, you could probably affect this is, and this goes for all politics, really. You can affect a lot more change at a local level than you could at a large level. So um, yeah. And also uh, please support all the indigenous candidates who are running. Most of them are running for the NDP right now. And uh, yeah, I'll be working with uh, Breen Ouellette, uh this weekend to try and get him elected as well. Well, Lance from the Surfs, uh, thank you so much, Lance. Really appreciate your time today, and uh, everyone should check out the Surfs. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. Folks, there's more of what you've just saw. Okay. Wow. Who asked? Are there other Surfs? Good question. 